Welcome to the Wild Ones podcast, episode 23. I'm Jimmy, this is Francis, and this is a show where we chat about bike stuff. What have you been up to, Francis? I'm so sleepy. Sleepy? Yeah, I've been doing this training plan, which I'm not allowed to talk about. However, it meant I had to do a training session yesterday, but I was down in London with my parents. I finally made it as an update to the train fiasco. And I didn't get back till 2 a.m. because my train sat there on the tracks still for like two extra hours. I got back at one and started my training session. Sounds horrible. It was horrible, yeah. My update would be I had a thimble too much wine and my head's a bit fuzzy. Is, it, is your tolerance that sensitive? A thimble? No, I, I'm... You are quite small, so a thimble's like, thank you. I'm, I'm under-exaggerating. Over-exaggerating. Over, and You're exaggerating. I'm I'm exaggerating it small. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I, I know I know exactly I'm, what you I'm mean. I'm exaggerating, but we, making it we smaller. We understand rather each other, but the problem is the people at home don't understand what we're talking about a lot of times, Jimmy. Do you think? Yeah. Oh, I disagree. I think we can that. basically communicate without speaking. And that would be really boring for people at home. We just did it then for a second. Exactly, a yeah. <laughs> I've been on the internet again. Well, firstly, you got some good presents coming up this week, but there's one in particular. Oh, yeah. I found you your Christmas present. <laughs> Have you? Yeah, go on. Yeah. And it's, uh, <laughs> it's I'm going to show you a picture of it and you can describe it for the listeners. It's pretty good. Okay. Are you going to telepathically send it to me? Yeah. Because we do that now. I will also put it on your laptop screen if that oh, doesn't. There it is. What do you reckon? It looks like a duck. No, it's not a duck. It's a, it's a bike saddle. An X-rated duck. Phallic. So yes. basically, right, so it looks like a normal saddle with a cutout in the middle. And then at the back is a phallic-like thing poking up into the air with significance. It's, uh, all right, it basically looks like it's a dick on the end of the saddle. <laughs> okay, let's not mince our words. Yeah, I'm just going to throw it out there. Yeah. Which I'm going to go you... be really clear with it. That's what it looks like. This, the, So this popped up in the news this week, in, in cycling news everywhere, obviously, and the meme pages went crazy. Uh, back in my bike shop days, which would have been 2010, maybe 2009, there was a saddle just like this, which was made by some bike fitting company. And it had, instead of the massive dildo sticking out the back it had like a shark fin style thing which went up your ass in your ass crack to keep you s sat in the middle of the saddle i don't think they're in business anymore uh, so you know that one so we'll, we'll talk about that one so the, the theory was that it's to stop you going too far back on the saddle the idea of that old one was yeah but i remember the sales rep coming in the shop and was like completely straight faced showing us this thing and we're all there like oh, really like you know, when you're trying to keep a laugh in, you're not allowed to laugh. That was, that's what it was like. Surely most of the issues with bikes and saddles is that bikes are too long and people are actually r sitting too far forward on the saddle. That surely is more common mm. than sitting too far off the back. Missing the pressure relief channel and then... Yeah. But maybe you're supposed to... What's the, what are the instructions here? This is supposed to make you sit further back in the saddle because you can feel where the back is. So I believe this is referred to as a backrest. Is it referred to as a backrest? I think it is, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, it is. This features slightly rude looking backrest, AKA spur. If that is a backrest, what kind of bike are you sitting that upright in? Like, so upright. like 90 degrees. It looks like it's shooting up 90 degrees. Maybe it's a funny angle. That seems bonkers to me, but I would like to put one on a bike because it'd be funny. Because it'd be fun. Funny. You might find it fun. I find it funny. I, I just, first, I just thought of you when I saw that picture. Well, thank, thank you. I look I'll forward to it arriving. There's 125 pounds. That's an expensive present for you, but it's Christmas coming up, so I'm yeah. prepared to push the bow. I'll put it through the business anyway. This is basically a solid pole. I mean, it's got sponge around it, I presume, but it doesn't look like a comfortable backrest. I'm willing to bet that this theory on this is the same as the one that you were talking about earlier. And it's not actually a backrest and it's uh, meant to stop, to get, encourage you to sit on the right bit of the saddle. Sure. I'm willing to bet that that's what it is. Marketing is it people, so long? marketing people love products like this because they get so much attention. We are now talking about it on this podcast, God along with it. every other meme place in the world because of what it looks like. And, you know, 
it's good marketing. Do you think Silka that that's what Silka did on purpose as well with their um they had like a go they had a mount for the front of their phallic mount. Basically, yeah. Yeah. It was called that as well, wasn't Aero. it? Aero. <laughs> it was, it was called that. <laughs> uh three hundred and ten grams for this saddle. Um fine. Cool. Get me one. Really? That's quite light considering how much volume it has. <laughs> considering the girth on it. <laughs> Can I say that? Yeah. Not a swear word. Are you actually going to get me one? I'm going to be really disappointed now if I don't have one of these. I'll see how you react to this week's um, presents because we have a video coming up. I bought you some other presents. Right. From the internet. Cool. So uh, one of them in particular, if you like that, we can get you the we can get you this as well well cool thank you thank you very much no i problem. like presents on to the news and things are not looking good for bradley wiggins at the moment he's reportedly facing bankruptcy over unpaid debts of almost one million pounds it's a bit of a complicated one essentially it stems from his business wiggins rights limited going into liquidation in 2020 as part of that process the liquidators are saying Wigo owes almost £980,000 in relation to a director's loan made to him. They're saying if he doesn't repay it, he'll have breached the terms of the liquidation agreement and could risk going bankrupt. Wigo disputes the £1 million claim and is currently trying to fight it. Liquidators now look to sell the intellectual property rights to the trademarks Bradley Wiggins, which is his name, that's insane. Wiggins and Wigo to recover the cash. In response, Wigo told Cycling Weekly that his money problems had gone on for a few years now with no apparent end in sight. He added, it's a very historical matter and involves professional negligence from others that has left a shit pile with my name at the front of it to deal with. What a sad story. Yeah, it's re my first emotional reaction to this is really sad. I like Bradley Wiggins. I think he's really funny. And mm -hmm. I think he's a great personality and he's achieved insanely, insane feats on the bike. He made cycling cool. Yeah. He's also a big guitar man. Is he? So it makes me feel like I've never, I've never actually met him. I've been in the same room as him and sort yeah. of like nodded. That, that was, that's been it. But uh, yeah, I'd love to meet him one day. Um, this is really sad and a shame. W can you explain? Probably not. The business side of this, there's there's some things I don't quite understand. I don't here. know enough about it. Which bit's jumping out at you? He has a limited business, which is his name, which is how a lot of people set up their self-employed stuff for all of the... He had multiple. I think there's a couple of businesses which okay. did different things. Typically, really rich sports people ha run all of their income through limited companies uh, as, as a, a right. So they would usually have a company which is like the right to... Francis Cade, and then that business operates all of the stuff associated to you. So like Ronaldo, for example, will probably have a business. I think there's been crackdowns on this because it's a technically tax evasion mm -hmm. uh, in a sense of you're earning an income and therefore you should be taxed as an income, whereas you can use limited businesses to push that income into various places and blah, 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 and pay less tax. Uh, I don't know the ins and outs of this. Uh, it's probably very complicated. By the sounds of it, he's say, suggesting that he wasn't actually operating Wigging Rights Limited, which is probably fair because he was a professional athlete doing that and probably had people doing things for him. Yeah. So, you know, professional ne negligence suggests that someone that was working for him that was paid to professionally run his business didn't do things as he was expecting and has left him in a bad position. What's a director's loan? So that would be money the business loans to a director. Typically, director's loans have to be paid back within, I think it's 10 months or... Uh, I think it's 10 months and then you have to pay interest on it and there's tax charges associated to director's loans. It's A director's loan is different from income or dividends. So it seems odd that there would be a director's loan of that scale. It's, it's essentially a very complicated probably very stressful and horrible position that he is inevitably, well, presumably not going to be able to get out with easily. Otherwise, he would have got out of it. Um, so hopefully he can get it resolved and finds a scenario where he can crack on doing the stuff he wants to do. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's, it's a shame, you know. He's, he's been an inspiration to many people. He's an incredible athlete and has had some really 
rubbish stuff over probably bits and pieces of his lifetime that he's talked about as well in the past. Um, and hopefully he lands on his feet. Yeah, I want to see him back on TV. Yeah, definitely. I want to see him doing his motorbike thing in the during the Tour de France where he's doing it like the live feed of him with a microphone, like interviewing people in the race. I, I tell you <laughs> like, what, it, the, when when we are ready to start bringing more presenters, someone like Wigo as a full time Cave Media presenter, <laughs> can you imagine? Can in, you imagine? That in. would be so sick. <laughs> It would be weird if someone bought his name. That is weird, right? I, I kind of get the Wigo, Wigo, and whatever the other one was, but the it's just his actual name. You can't like. I think in a in a world of social media, I don't think that works anymore because in the past, in the past, celebrities haven't had their own platform to talk about what they want, so they relied on, I guess, like press and that kind of thing. So if for example, I wanted to buy the rights to Wiggle and then set up a business that was called Wiggle Whatever. It might be harder for him to prove that he's not associated, but he can just go on Instagram and go, "This isn't me. I've had to sell my name," and people aren't going to buy it. People are all people love Wiggle and therefore are going to support Wiggle. And then if he says, "This isn't anything to do with me," I just I just don't feel like there's there's only value attached to that if it's actually directly associated to him. Surely, yep. I feel like that, that is a fair analysis. But obviously the business is just trying to recover money from assets and maybe that's the only... It would only asset. have value if people if people are Googling Wigo or Googling Wiggins yeah. and then it comes up as like, oh, it's a cycling kit brand or something like that. It's just weird and it's dirty. And I feel like if, if I was a business, I wouldn't want to be associated to the downfall of someone who's such a a great hero and is like an inspiration. So you can't sell some off his name. Some businesses don't and, care. Though, yeah, do it's weird. It's, yeah. it's icky, isn't it? It feels like a threat to me. Mm. Mm. because they are they know they're not going to recover a million pounds from selling the rights to those those words so it's i feel like it's a threat yeah i think you're right jimmy though it, it must be horribly stressful and rubbish to have it happen and have it happen so publicly the reason we're talking about it is because it's it's been the biggest bit of news that's come out this week but mm -hmm. poor guy i love wiggins i think he's great yeah household name and like in the UK, household name for the American viewers and people abroad, like they they might not be, they might not know of Wiggins as much. But I disagree. Everyone like that people who people who aren't into cycling here, everyone knows Wigo, don't they? It was during the Olympics and everything. Do you remember that? It was such like, a great it time, was wasn't huge. it? It, it was. There was huge. a massive boom of because um, of because of him and back. Team Sky. Totally. Yeah. I reckon more people know. Uh, you know, the average person on the street in England know who he is over Mark Cavendish. What about Wales like, and Wigo's Scotland? Um, not them. No, not no, them. Okay, cool. Next, this might be one of the most refreshing interviews with a pro cyclist in ages. Geraint Thomas has admitted he's been drunk 12 out of the last 14 nights. <laughs> he's told the Times that he's enjoying his off-season to the max after signing a new two-year deal with Ineos Grenadiers. He said, I don't know if it's a British mentality, the culture of just going out and getting drunk when you're young that sticks with you and that's the way I socialize. You go to the pub, meet your mates, have a few pints and go home. And it's a knock-on effect. The next day you're hungover and you want something salty, bacon or something. But he reckons it actually helps him with his mentality when it comes to training. He added, that blowout, that real normality is what I need because now I'm like, mate, I really need to get on the bike and get structured again. To have those periods of real intensity, focus, and dedication from November to whatever the big goal of the year is, to do that, I kind of need these blowouts where I switch from the whole cycling or switch off from the whole cycling world. I speak to some cyclists because they're my mates, but I don't think about cycling. I love Garen Thomas. He's such a lad. <laughs> the, the only bit I dislike about what he's saying is he's kind of making it cool to get wrecked every night for the best part of two weeks, which is a, <laughs> which is ex extreme and people shouldn't do. I mean, that is only because he's doing them the whole uh, rest of the season. It's not like if you're already drinking a couple of nights a week, then then you're inspired by this to go and do 12 <laughs> nights in a row. But the fundamental principles of what he's saying, I massively agree, agree with, which is mm -hmm. don't like cycling, even to someone that's at this level of cycling, he's saying cycling isn't everything to him. There's other things in his life that he enjoys doing and he does. And he doesn't spend 100% of his time talking about and thinking about cycling, which is healthy and really, really good. And 
the idea that he can be at his level, but he also has breaks from that. You know, he isn't training every single day, every single day of the year. He isn't permanently at race weight because that isn't how people function. People have cycles. They peak and they drop off and they peak and they drop off. And that's a healthy way. You can't be at your best 100% of the time. He's setting a, a good but also terrible example yeah. for kids who are in the sport. That, Like you said, it's, the principle is, is correct. Mm-hmm. The methods of relaxing or doing something non-cycling related, questionable. However, if it's only for that amount of time a year. The context of this as well is basically that he's going back to Cardiff and all of his mates are like, do you fancy coming out? So it's it's almost like he's cramming all of his socializing into one time because he doesn't get to do that as well. So I guess, again, it's not necessarily healthy, but it's because he has such an intense routine that takes away his time from family and friends all throughout the rest of the year. What are nights out like in Cardiff? Chaos. I've been I've been on a night out in Cardiff with Garrett Thomas. Oh, what was it like? I think I, I, we were probably... Like late teens, he w- he was he was part of the GB squad for the training for the Olympics. I think at the time he was living in, but he was living in Manchester and Italy. He wasn't a big name at this point, but he was like he had probably like won a gold medal, but no one really knew who he was. It was that kind of thing, mm. um, and he was his absolute chaos. He is wild like properly properly wild uh so if he's been on it was it 12 out of 14 i would imagine there would have been a lot of stories coming from that mm-hmm. if i'm not mistaken the the night when when i went out with him the next day it turned out that he had like jumped over the fence into his mate's garden and dug up the whole garden just because he thought it was funny it's quite funny he's just he's just he's just wild he's properly wild Ah, good i think it's a i mean Loads of alcohol is not good for you, but I completely sympathize with it being a good way to have a break Yeah, from extremely regimented lifestyle. We'd always do that in off season. But bearing in mind as well, you know, he's saying he's been drunk 12 out of 40 and that might've just been a couple of beers. You know, it, it, this doesn't mean he's paralytic, although he is from Cardiff, which means he probably was paralytic 12 out of 14. Good. <laughs> so yeah, well, well done, Garrett. Have a good time. Yeah. Enjoy yourself. Mm. And uh, when you're ready to become a professional TV presenter, there's a space for you at Cade Media along with Wiggos. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? In. He has a podcast, Gary and Thomas. Oh, he does, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. really good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. He does it when he's, he gets people to dial in remotely, doesn't he? Yeah. And he would just be sat on a bed. He's getting a during massage During the stage race. Yeah, getting around. Yeah. <laughs> now on to our big question of the day. What cycling announcements would you drink your own wee if they happened? <laughs> right, so I suggested this because... I saw on social media a thing about someone that drank their own urine. The backstory is this is someone that I think is in the social media space for computer games. He said that if GTA 6 is officially announced this week, he will drink his own urine because he was so confident that it wasn't going to happen. And then they announced it. Damn. And he drank his own urine. It's been like 10 years, maybe longer. Is it that long? Yeah, so really, wow. it's really been a long time. So I thought it'd be a fun game for us to talk about some cycling themed stuff that if that happens, we would also be willing to drink our year in. And I have my first point, number one on the list. Let's hear it. Lance Armstrong announces his return to the Tour de France next year. <laughs> oh, Tour de France. Okay. Can you mm. imagine? <laughs> He's Unlikely, like, but that's the idea. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming, I'm pretty certain he still has a lifetime ban. Okay. Y- you said his return at the Tour de France. What if next year he ends up becoming like a, prof- a pro commentator or something, which is still probably unlikely given his history with the Tour de France. However, I think based on what you said, that would still count. No, it wouldn't. So well, you're saying specifically no. as a rider. Well, well yeah, definitely cheating. as a rider. You can't say that then because he's got a lifetime ban. You can't roll back the ban. And thus I would drink urine. <laughs> <laughs> not going to happen. That's the whole point. It's not going to happen. What else can we add to the list then? Specialized launcher bike that actually fits people. <laughs> that doesn't have weird bendy wiggly suspension and stupid plastic like rubber inserts that make it spongy. That is savage. Yeah. Well. <laughs> they must, they, but what about their endurance bikes? They must have an endurance one that fits people. Yeah, but people. it's all squishy. It's the Roubaix. And there's not a non- This is the, pr- like, 
Why can't bike companies just make a relaxed geometry version of the race bike? That's it. Same weight, looks the same, same paint job. It's the one that you look, you get advertised in the Tour de France every single time you're watching instead of one that doesn't fit. Just get a version of that with a different geometry. I don't know. I mean, I've got one based on that is um, you guys go a week without talking about specialised. <laughs> <laughs> they live in your head rent free. Repla- insert any big bike brand company's name where specialized was it's the same thing no one does a relaxed geometry version okay scott do uh a relaxed geometry version of their addict rc it's the addict but i would like it to be even more relaxed because it's still quite an aggressive bike yeah it it, it does that there just isn't much in the space of like correctly fitting bikes no pinarello did one but it's like it's about five thousand pounds it's a little bit heavy you look at heavy at five thousand pounds it's not the same grade of carbon fiber as their top 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 end ones but it's the shortest bike race bike on the well it's the shortest road bike modern road bike on the market at the moment and james is like it's, it fits so many people he's so excited about it he's so like when i came into the shop he's like wow this thing's amazing and the it's that that's what he can easily fit people on and then sell to them. But it's not as high end as people want. It's not the spec that they, a lot of James's customers have money to spend on bikes, right? Uh, and it's not as high end as it could be. I think we're going to get called out on this. I think there's going to be a big list of comments suggesting bikes that are relaxed geometry. And I think what you're saying though, is if you actually dig into it, they're not really relaxed geometry. Yeah, they, they're they not say, relaxed enough. They say they are, but in practice they're actually not mm. yeah people can't tolerate the the really long positions Th- that's the thing i notice most about r- having ridden a hell of a lot of bikes is it for me the thing that stands out is that it's always the length they're so long everything is so long mm-hmm. it just it just doesn't make sense James to me. Tell you. it's um people can tolerate drop far more they can far more than they can tolerate reach yeah what's more if you reduce the reach of a bike you start affecting the handling significantly. So you can put a Diddy stem on a race bike, but then it handles like crap and then you don't want to ride it. So you're better off with a purpose-made nice geometry that fits people and then just make it super, super light. Specialized had a great chance with the Athos to do this. What were you going to say, Emily? Is a suggestion not to just um, ride a smaller bike than you think you should be? Or does nah, that create other then, problems? then it creates other problems. Yes and no, but then you'll get, well, for me, I always ride really small bikes. The problem with that is you get hideous amounts of toe overlap. It, it's it, it's not really the right solution. It'll be too low. You'd have loads of seat posts sticking out, toe overlap. Although uh, you, it's all small frames are going to have toe overlap. On off the shelf bikes, I have like half a foot toe overlap. Yeah. I got loads of toe overlap on all my bikes. I don't mind. Well, on a road bike, it's fine. It's part of it. Uh, Yeah. Because you're not doing like full, you know, you're leaning in corners. Yeah, yeah. Right. I got one. Yeah. British Cycling actually invests in grassroots cycling. (laughs) (laughs) But they probably spent all their money on on, like marketing people. (laughs) Yeah, I don't know. New logo. Let's put the blue where the red is instead. Flip it around. Yeah. 100K. Um, that would be a ama- I I would uh, I would be happy to drink my own wee if that <laughs> happened because it would be so good for racing in the UK, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would. And just yeah. just people getting on bikes. The ASO actually making an equivalent prize pot for women's races. <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> yes. Can you imagine that actually happens? They'll never do it. At least per kilometer of so- race ridden. For those that don't know, the ASO are the organizers and owners, I believe, of the Tour de France and a handful of other races. Mm. Um, And there have been numerous battles with with the ASO for a long amount of time trying to get the women's Tour de France, one, to happen, and two, for it to actually be on the same platform as the men's. Mm -hmm. And it still isn't. It's not even just the ASO that does it, like every... Every major race that goes on, the prize money discrepancy is huge, isn't it? That someone did the analysis on the last on the twenty twenty three 
Tour de France. And the Tour de France winner, the men's Tour de France winner, got paid 146.8 euros per kilometer, while the women's Tour de France winner, winner, winner got paid 52 euros per kilometer. So the discrepancy is still absolutely mahoosive. Yeah, and that's nothing to do with sponsorship. That is just prize money. Prize money, yeah. For, yeah, yeah, podium in or winning. So yeah, I will yep. I'll drink my wee if the ASO ever actually equal that up. And happy, be happy about it. Mm. Cav doesn't get his 35th stage win <gasps> of the Tour de France. Doesn't get it. So you Doesn't get it. So you're you're very confident he is going to get it. Correct. All right. I'm not being year specific either. Because if he doesn't get it this year, he crashes out again. I bet he does another year. Surely not. <laughs> he'll just keep going forever. He'll be like 80 and still up there. Chasing that 35th. Yep. I feel like that's the first one we've had where it might actually happen so he might not get it in mm -hmm. which case you're gonna be drinking some wee don't want to drink wee. would you prefer to drink your wee or someone else's wee my wee because you know what's in it most of the time <laughs> most of the time you know what's in it or most of the time you'd prefer to drink yours most of the time i know what's in it right okay the last on the list that we made earlier is <laughs> big bike br big bike brands actually make a good entry-level bike for under 500 pounds <laughs> with good geometry as well well yeah just like a good entry-level bike we know it's doable we know they have the buying power just do it just just do it it's allowed to be heavy please Doesn't just matter. do it please make please. it make it accessible it's a foot in the it door. like it's a smart business decision surely because it gets you brand loyal like i was i if, if someone buys an entry level a specialized LA or a Scott addict and they really like it. And it's the entry level one. It's their first bike. First time they've ridden a road bike with drop handlebars and they have a great time. And you have all those experiences. You're more likely to then buy the same brand after that. Mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah, Surely. It's interesting that the, the content you've done on decathlon has been so popular and it obviously shows there's a market for it. I actually think that is something that will happen. Maybe not right now, but I think, in the next couple of years, that probably will happen. In the same way that, for example, Rafa started off as only top of the range expensive stuff, and then they brought in their core stuff. I think um, once bike brands, and they'll all be feeling the squeeze right now of sales not coming in, you start to go, okay, well, how can we get a better haul of market? And then you look at someone like Decathlon doing really well, and you go, okay, we need a bit of that. You guys actually might facilitate that revolution as well because you're proving how popular stuff like decathlon is hope so yep i want to see more people on bikes that's it that's the mission and if that happens by more variety of affordable bikes out there then great what else can we we should do other things maybe we should do some other stuff we should do some campaigning we what should, just things we should we should do some like guerrilla campaigning where we like go to uh westminster and punch all the politicians <laughs> <laughs> well that's another i mean that uh, yeah 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 I, c I couldn't think of an example that was the, that was the best i had <laughs> time for another round of overrated or underrated i'm gonna read out a list of stuff and you're gonna tell me if they're overrated or underrated first up suggested by carl endurance bikes underrated for stuff that we talked about earlier an yeah. endurance bike should be a relax, a better, more likely to fit most people bike. It often isn't, but it's still going to be better than a non-endurance bike for most people. Therefore, they are underrated. There's always, yeah, 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 underrated, underrated. And uh, the majority of people who buy bikes and are not going to be riding them for 15 hours a week to get used to tolerating a position like that and have, having even developing the fitness to tolerate a position like that because mm -hmm. a lot of it is wattage based. If you're doing 200 watts all day, there's less pressure through your contact points. An endurance bike is probably going to suit people better. Yes, I'm definitely at the point in my cycling, I don't think Cree is the right word, uh, that endurance bikes should be at the top of my list. They often are not because <laughs> I'm an idiot, <laughs> but they should be. Just not weird ones with squishy, squishy shit in them that squishy. goes wrong and then you can't replace it. If you're going to put some squishy stuff on a bike, redshift stem. Because it's just like, like uh, if it goes wrong, 
which it's unlikely to because it's extremely well made. You just put a, put your normal stem back on and send it back. Like there's no pain in the ass mechanical situation to deal with. Mm-hmm. Whereas the future shock in a specialized headset, any bike shock, like if you mentioned future shock to Nick, he melts. <laughs> he does. Yeah. Stop yeah. doing it. Just make just make an athos with relaxed geometry. <laughs> So another suggestion from Carl is not cycling when the weather gets too cold. I'm 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 a fan. I'm a fan of the turbo. Underrated. 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 Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It gets confusing sometimes, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> I think that is underrated. Even Twenty-three weeks later. The thing that upsets me the most is people, and they quote the what do they call it? Voluminati the rules of cycling which were made in jest and people take them religiously one of them is harden the f up um and people quote it all of the time when the weather gets crap and then they then post a picture of them in hospital with a broken collarbone and i'm like well if it's icy what's the point what is the point just just don't just take a day off do a turbo spend some time with your family B- build build uh, something I don't know. Build something. Well, I was gonna say like I don't know, do some decorating. Jimmy's oh, okay. into building. Oh, you I'm know a, you're building. I'm yeah, not Lego. You got big boy stuff going on. Yeah. You've built like a a TV bench. Bench. Yep. Shelf, yep. which looks surprisingly. I'm gonna good. do a kitchen next. Sorry, I was surprised, but I was. Did you hear that? I'm gonna do the kitchen next. The whole kitchen. I'm gonna build all of the cabinets. And this is an example Sweet. of something you can do instead of riding in the ice and getting Brilliant. a broken collarbone. Um, can I caveat this with if you do want to go riding and you or you have to for some reason you're training and like being on the turbo just cracks you ride off road because then you take out cars from the equation and you take out a lot of slippery surfaces from the equation too yes not all of them not all, yeah okay you're gonna like cross a road and things like that well no but even on the off-road stuff you can still get sheet eyes you can but it's a better option or or it can perhaps extend yeah. You're outside riding when the weather's rubbish. Totally. And you're also moving slower, so you stay warmer. You Speak haven't got the yourself. wind chill. It's all, well, you, you go faster <laughs> off ride, do yeah, you? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've had some very memorable and fantastic, fabulous rides in the snow on the mountain bike. And I think that's the bit, like, if it is snowing, it's such a great thing. Location dependent, of course. Well, interestingly, though, if, if it's snowing, if there's snow on the ground, there's less likely to be sheet ice. And therefore, in theory... Why is it less likely to be sheet ice? Because you've got snow over the top of the ice. Which is grippy. Well, it's it's soft, it compacts. Yeah. So if you if you like so when the weather here in the northeast is kind of between like minus two and two degrees, you get a lot of ice mm-hmm. and therefore it's absolute chaos because it melts and it melts and ices, freeze thaws, freeze thaws, freeze thaws. So you end up with just sheet ice everywhere. Whereas when it is in the point where it's like minus two to minus six, which we get quite often and it snowed, you just get loads of snow everywhere, which you can just run on, walk on, blah, 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 blah. Yep. But the same still applies. If the weather's crap, don't feel like you have to go out, you don't. Yep. Do you know Phil Gaiman? Yep. Yes. Professional cyclist. He's on Gaiman. Instagram. And Gaiman, one of Gaiman. Gaiman. Do you know Phil Gaiman? <laughs> just edit that bit over. <laughs> just don't, just leave all of that in. Who are you talking and, to? And this edit, edit that bit. You edit it, Emily. Yeah, just a note for Please myself. leave all of this <laughs> in, please. <laughs> he has a saying i think it's him i've heard him say it which is basically he has the philomenati yes and his thing is suffering is a choice Mm -hmm. not a requirement and that's basically it isn't it like if you want to go outside fine but i don't think like it should be a mark on someone's character if they don't want to go outside. i thought you were about to say something weather related from (laughs) phil phil guyman which he, he has no weather. It's just sunny every day where he lives. Well, this is it, isn't it? We we are in a microclimate where it actually does snow. So cold yeah, weather yeah, to yeah. us goes, oh, snow. But some people, it's it's everything's relative though, isn't it? If you're used to 30 degrees Celsius, then 15 degrees Celsius feels cold. Whereas we're used to 15, so minus five feels cold. It doesn't even feel cold anymore, to be honest. It's not. No, it feels quite nice. Yeah, it's minus five in here at the moment. Mm-hmm. Put jumper on, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Suggested by Matthew, we've got two more. Waking up early. Overrated. Underrated. I'm I'm assuming this is referring to people that get up at like four or five in the morning because it's like, 
I should be up early and do things. It's overrated. You should sleep well and wake up when your body wants to wake up. I I love waking up early and I get a lot of stuff. I, I love that morning. I love that morning time. However, I've finally succumbed to the fact that I'm a nine hour sleep guy. Yes. And I'm best when I get nine hours, which is within the healthy range. I've read a lot of stuff about it and I thought there was something wrong with me, but it's been ever since I was a teenager and it's just nine hours, I'm better. So I, I, I take this point to mean intentionally waking yourself up early rather than... Um, You're forcing it. Yes. Yep. In which case I think is overrated. Whereas some people, like uh, Pritch, I think he's one of those guys. He's like 5 a.m., Four a.m. He gets up at four a.m. Four a.m. But he force it. He gets eight hours of sleep every day. He does force it. Yeah. He goes to bed really early, so he still gets his eight hours. Is that forcing it, or is that just adjusting your window? Well, he of... forces it in a sense. He sets an alarm. Okay. He sets yeah, an alarm yeah, yeah. at four o'clock. He gets up and goes. Oh, I probably don't want to really want to be up because it's dark outside. That was actually quite a good impression of Pritch, wasn't it? Oh. This is this is Pritch from Dirty Sanchez for yes. the people who don't know. Uh, and the people that still don't know that Sanchez was a massive TV show like Jack Welsh version of Jackass. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, he, he still gets his eight hours. I, I agree with you in that I like being up early. I like, but I, I kind of, I go to bed early ish. I'm up varying between kind of like seven and nine o'clock. I like it when I get up at, you know, six, seven, eight o'clock naturally, but still have had my sleep because I always get loads of stuff done. And mm -hmm. I, 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 I agree. I like the morning period of time. Yeah. Can I say, as someone who struggles to get up early, I go to bed early and I wake up late. I'm an 11 to 12 hour sleep gal. <laughs> but in the winter, it's definitely it's, it's definitely harder to wake up when it's very, very dark. A daylight alarm clock is an absolute game changer. Mm. So you, you set it. So say you want to wake up at eight o'clock, you set it. And from seven o'clock, it will slowly get lighter and lighter and lighter mm. in your room. And you wake up feeling so much better. That, and that's bright enough. It is, is it a yeah, big yeah. piece of kit? What's the deal? It's maybe, it's like a dinner plate, I guess. Yeah. With a light around it and it starts off very, very soft and just gradually gets lighter and lighter. So it's the idea of replicating the sun coming up. Even at its brightest, it's not like having the main light on. Yeah. But it's significantly lighter than dark and therefore your brain responds to it as sunrise. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it really works. It's so good. Mm. I tell you what I find with alarms. If, if I have a consistent alarm, I will nearly always wake up five or ten minutes before it goes off me too i love that i love how our bodies know what time it is that's seriously oh. weird uh, how i love it how. i do um when i do have to be up for something don't want to be late for podcast <laughs> uh i use a thing which jake martin taught me jakey cakey which is alarm goes off you don't want to get up but you say the rhyme and do the action one two three four feet on the floor <laughs> Is that what you do yeah. to this day? Oh, every that's how I wake up. It's how I make sure I get up. And then uh <laughs> can you imagine him saying it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think of him every morning. Oh my goodness. <laughs> then I go downstairs, usually put kettle on for a coffee, which is bad. I'm addicted to it at the moment. Trying I'm working not bad. on that. Coffee isn't bad. Uh, yeah, but uh, having it too early in, in your it isn't waking bad. up process. Is, just because someone's told you it's bad doesn't mean it's bad. Well, it, it's not terrible, but it is what it is. Um, <laughs> then go outside, have a little walk around my garden with the daylight, which is sometimes not there because we live in the Northeast. Now we have about two hours of daylight of the day before it gets dark again. Mm -hmm. A second suggestion from Matthew. And I love this one. Pierce Brosnan as James Bond. Underrated. I'm going to say underrated as well. As a, a, a Bond purist will probably say overrated. I'm going to say underrated because it is my childhood. Like Pierce Brosnan as James Bond is the 90s and 90s film. 90s Hollywood was just wicked. That Golden Eye films, oh. is a brilliant film. Yeah. And weirdly relevant. And you guys didn't even know I did this. So I don't, where, how, does, how does Matthew know that I've been watching James Bond? I watched all of the Daniel Craig films. Casino Royale is one of the best films ever made. And then I was like, oh, I've run out of James Bond now. I'll go back a bit. And I've started watching the Pierce Brosnan ones. The ones with the guy with the diamonds in his face. Mm -hmm. uh, that one's not so good. But GoldenEye is a brilliant film. We actually 
how do, how were we playing Goldeneye the game the other day on Xbox? It's yeah. on that. It's on the Game Pass. Oh yeah, you were there. You, you played yeah. Rogue Rose, House. weren't you? Yeah, yeah. the God. sniper rifle that hasn't aged well, has it? No. It was still, Whereas it's the still movie good. has. The movie is good. The movie's good. Mm. And that was his first. That was Pierce Brosnan's first James Bond. Very good. I believe. You're going to keep going backwards, older and older, and see how far you get. <sighs> you've got to go through some real sh patches, haven't have, you? <laughs> have you even Have you even watched the old ones? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they're the sort of things that when I was a kid would be on like on a Sunday afternoon mm -hmm. and it'd be like Roger Moore's blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. And some of them are great. I haven't watched them since I was a kid though, so I can't imagine how well they've aged. I think they'd probably be great, to be honest. Yeah, there's that peak madness of uh, Moonraker. And all of those movies where the bad guys were just extravagant and it was brilliant. What's the guy that played the James Bond that everyone hates and was rubbish? I can't remember his name. George Lazenby? Yeah. I don't think I've even ever seen one of those. I might have, but it's been removed from, from my brain. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's probably quite harsh. Maybe I'll watch one of his ones one day and actually see if there's truth in the the reputation yeah there's also a weird version of casino royale as well oh no which is like a comedy thing is it comedy well it's a, it's kind of it's really it, not the same vibe as the old ones even it's it's more like comedy based than the other really? ones really I, I believe i haven't seen it i was reading some stuff on it Maybe I yeah i know one. that yeah there was an original casino royale which presumably is based on a book called yeah. casino royale but the latest one casino royale the Craig one, I think, is one of the, it's such a great film. That was when it went dark, wasn't it? Was that the dark, first? Dark, but with nods to the funny bits of the old James Bonds. That was the first one with Daniel Craig, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I tell you what, I try to watch Casino Royale, and I could not understand a word anyone was saying because they talk so posh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether it's just a and northern, northern thing. And so I just sort of checked out. I could not understand it. Last one is a suggestion from Kevin. Bone conducting headphones. Overrated. Overrated. I'm assuming you've used some then. Yeah, I've got some. I have some Aftershocks. Or shock, I think they changed their name to Shocks. Did you pay for them or did they send them to you? I think they got sent to me or Fusion. I think Adam from Fusion Media gave them to me. Yeah, there was definitely a point where they were slinging them at everyone, wasn't mm -hmm. there? I, didn't, I turned them down because I don't like freebies. It's like a thing that goes around the back of your head with uh, headphones on that go near your ears. And it's just a very small, very loud speaker that plays that they claim is bone conduction. So you can hear the music really clearly. And so can everyone else. I, yeah, I, I have used some and I had the same experience. So I, I didn't find them conducting through my head I just, they were just little speakers next to my ears rather yes. than in my ears. Yeah. Chris Hall, our mate, did suggest that they were, for him, very significant. So I'm assuming that for some people, they just work better than others. Please keep sending in your overrated and underrated suggestions to Wild Ones Podcast at cademedia.co.uk. And those were very good. Thank you. Thank you. Matthew, Carl, and Kevin. Oh, that's like a TV show. My laptop stopped working, so... <laughs> Fluff up of the week. We have a fluff up this week, don't we, Jimmy? We do, unfortunately, and it was upsetting. So uh, we this week we are animal sitting for Emily's parents who have a lot of animals. Most of them are rescues. Um, one, this said animal, Bobby the bunny was one-eyed, was left to run around the world. So it was a pet, someone's pet. that Left they, to run around the world. Yeah. So it was a pet that they just kind of abandoned in a field, which was near where their other animals are. So they asked the person if they were going to actually look after their bunny, and they basically said no. So Emily's parents ended up looking after this bunny. And it was really old, something like 14, 15 years old. They had it for about seven years, and it was apparently about the same, that age before they got it. And it was a lovely little sweet thing. We took it on Friday night. Yes. Yeah, so Emily's parents have gone on holiday. We're animal sitting. It was brought to our house to look after it. And by Saturday morning, it was deceased. It was deceased. Why? Age. Natural causes, I believe. We knew the bunny was, was unwell. 
there was a possibility it was going to go the journey, and unfortunately it did on day one. So we um, took him in a box to my mum's field and dug a hole and buried him. We did. It was. I said some words. I gave him some grass in his little hole, and I've checked on him ever since. What? Why are you checking on him? If I'll he comes sure back to life, like a pet cemetery sort it's, of. It's it's more. I I'm just making sure I've buried him appropriately, so he doesn't just get dug up and mutilated, even though he's dead. But he will decompose and add lovely nutrients to the ground. I actually thought the process was was. Uh, it highlighted to me even more so that when I go, a natural burial would be lovely. You actually add some value back to the the ground. I'd put you in a pet cemetery. Just to see. To see what? If you come back to life. Don't come back to life. Wait, what? What the hell is going on? You finally got rid of him. No, 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 no. <laughs> but just like, it's never going to be good, is it? Let's finish up with listeners takeover. And this one is from Fergus. He says, I've just signed up for my first sportive. Have you got any tips either for training or on the day? Well, this is a great question and a really easy one for you because not that long ago, you made a video called... Seven things I wish I knew before my first cycling event. I think I can remember some of them. I bet you can't. Go on. Don't get carried away because there's lots of people riding close to you and possibly faster than the pace you can sustain. It's easy to just get carried away and follow people and then burn all your matches in the first 10 miles and then have a miserable time for the rest. Remember to charge your DI2 and your Garmin and your other things like power meter. Because if that... It runs out on a vent day. That's annoying, especially if it's something you've trained for for a long time and you're invested in it and you've spent lots of money getting there and time getting there. Charge your stuff. Is is one of them like eat and drink regularly or remember to? Remember to eat and drink regularly. You can set up alerts on your head unit, which is quite a good feature. Oh, okay. Um, because again, lots of distractions. So you're not just on a ride on your own, which you might be used to. Suddenly you've got people to chat to and you forget to eat. And then before you know it, if it's if you feel hungry, then it's usually too late. If you've got 100 miles to ride, that's a big deal. And once you're behind in fueling, you're stuffed. I, th- I think what I've taken from your response is, I think the best thing for Fergus, Fergus to do is actually just search for seven things I wish I knew before my first cycling event. And you've made a video to answer all those questions. That's true. Look there in the Fergus. comments as well. I feel like there was extra ones in the comments that were really good. Yeah, people always add their their own experience experiences. I often find making videos like that, it's 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 hard to remember what it's like going back to your first cycling event or first bikepacking trip or whatever the topic might be. And there's a there's a lot of thought that is involved in choosing the right things. Um yeah, it's things that at first you have to think quite hard about that become second nature over time, isn't it? Mm-hmm. I, I often give this piece of advice for many, many, many things, not just sport related. And I oh, and people, I think, hate it, but I still give it. <laughs> I think it's important to not be afraid to fail. But I think people think that if they think that they, if they give themselves the option to not to not finish something, not achieve something, then they're less likely to do it. Whereas I'm a believer of, doesn't matter like you know like if there's a reason for you to not do it then that reason is is appropriate and that doesn't mean you're not going to do it again in the future so my my advice is if or if jimmy's if, advice is don't do it <laughs> <laughs> yeah do you, are you talking about halfway through the event when things are getting yes, hard or I'm, are you talk- I'm, I'm talking about you might get 75 miles into a 100 mile event your, your knee is aching you haven't got any food left and there's nowhere else to get food you're dehydrated don't ride anymore because you might do yourself damage. Sorry, I can't. T- I, all I'm thinking of is Jimmy being essentially Mr. Demotivator. <laughs> this is why I think people don't like it when I say Sit, it. Have a, have a sleep. <laughs> this is what people Chill. take from that. That is what that is what people take from it because they have to go hard love on themselves to be able to achieve stuff. Yeah. Well, then you're probably doing the wrong thing if that's if that's the option. You should be doing it because you want to achieve it, not because it feels like it's a burden and you have to do it. You don't have to do it. You're choosing to do it. Mm. Just like old old Phil. Phil, what do you say? Gaiman. 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 You know, it's a, it's a choice. And therefore, you can choose to not do it and come back another time. Do everything you can to prepare yourself so that you have a good time. But no, there's always an option. To have a bad time. To get out of it. <laughs>
I guess, is what you're saying. Yes, exactly. Equipment failure is the one that gets me. Like if that that really can ruin a day and it's not, it's a very easy fix. Just check things the night before. But that, but that still doesn't mean that something isn't going to fail. True. So, so my point in that scenario is, you know, if you get 15 punctures halfway through, just go, oh, do you know what? Maybe this one wasn't for me. Come back, go back the next year. Have a better time. That is all for this episode. Remember, you can send us your funny stories, questions and stuff to Wild Ones Podcast at cavemedia.co.uk. If you got this far and you like this episode, please leave us a five-star review and make sure to follow and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Thank you so much for listening and see you guys soon. Well, that was weird. You will listen to us soon is what I meant. We don't see them. We don't. We don't.